Without any further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Dan Vimon. Dan is a professor of atmospheric and oceanic sciences here at UW-Madison, and he directs the Nelson Institute Center for Climatic Research, and he co-directs the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts. So Dan, please go ahead and thank you very much for presenting today. Thanks, it's good to be here. Um, uh, glad, to, glad to see everyone. Uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, uh, it's nice to be able to uh, uh, speak with Chris Kucherik as well. Chris and I, about a decade ago, were doing the uh, climate change uh, roadshow, uh, where we would we would back to back uh, talk about climate change and impacts in Wisconsin uh, when Wiki was coming out with its first uh, assessment report. And so it's fun to be uh, back on the ticket with him again. So I'm definitely the opening act uh, in, in this case. So. Um, Good to see everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share screen and get going here. All right. All right. Um, I was asked to talk uh, about uh, trends and projections in uh, climate change trends and projections in Wisconsin uh, today. And so I was going to uh, share some of the work that's been done uh, at, uh, uh, at the Center for Climatic Research. Uh, in support of the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts. And then if you have any questions about this, feel free and uh, type them into the chat bar or save them for later. It'll be, we'll be sticking around a little bit. Um, and then uh, uh, feel free and uh, the, the website here, www.wiki.wisc.edu. I'll put that in the chat bar when we're done here. And then you can follow us if you want. If you want to, we have a, we have a newsletter uh, that we send out about monthly with, with just updates. Uh, and then we post uh, new stuff on, on Twitter. So you're welcome to follow us uh, there. If you have questions for me, you can also just get in touch with me directly um, at UW. Okay, I'd like to start off here. Let's see, a little historical context. This is a quote that I like uh, because of a number of things. One, uh, it, it shows that uh, uh, the, the, the science here is, has been around for a long time. Uh, so the quote, an atmosphere of carbon dioxide would give to our earth a high temperature. And is, if, as some suppose, at one period in it, of its history, the air had a mixture with it, a larger proportion than at present, an increased temperature. And that is a quote by Eunice Foote in 1856. And her work uh, predates Tyndall's work on this by a few years. But of course, uh, uh, do, was, um, I shouldn't say of course, uh, um, due to the, uh, uh, her, her work was, was not cited uh, until recently. And Tyndall was usually given credit for uh, the, the experiments that uh, um, uh, looked at the role of carbon dioxide in, in temperature. Uh, I like this quote also, uh, Eunice Foote, uh, there, there are 14 papers published in the 19th century by women uh, uh, first authors uh, in physical sciences. 14, Eunice has four of them. And this is one, so it's a, a nice way to, to um, highlight uh, uh, her work. So where are we? Global climate change. Um, for uh, the history of humans, 125,000 years, we go back and that's when the earliest homo sapien fossils show up. Uh, there may be some evidence, another back of it, like 200,000 years of, of similar. Uh, but either way, uh, for the history of humans, for 800,000 years at least, carbon dioxide levels in our atmosphere have fluctuated between about 150 and 300 parts per million. Uh, when Eunice Foote wrote that, carbon dioxide levels were at 285 parts per million. Uh, it took about, uh, let's see here, about 60 years to get to 300 parts per million, and then another 90 to get to 350 parts per million. Uh, 350 parts per million occurred in 1988. And in uh, 2014, uh, April 2014, we passed 400 parts per million for the first time in the history of humans. Uh, as you can see, carbon dioxide levels fluctuate up and down every year with the annual cycle. Uh, after we, we hit 400 parts per million, we hit summer and then winter. And then in November 2015, we passed 400 parts per million for the last time. Carbon dioxide in our atmosphere will never again uh, in any of our lifetimes, be below uh, 400 parts per million. That's something that uh, the question is, how much more will we add and how fast? 
Global temperature, an update on global temperature. 2020 was the second warmest year on record uh, to 2015-2016. 2015-2016 was a massive El Nino event, and that's why it was so warm. Uh, there was no El Nino. There's no, no uh, substantial El Nino event last year. Uh, and if you look at the spikes in this temperature record, here's the 2015-2016 El Nino. Here's the 1997-8-98 El Nino. Here's the big 1982-83 El Nino. So uh, while there is variability in here, uh, and El Nino is about the biggest thing that can happen to the climate system aside from this long-term trend here, uh, that variability is small compared to the signal that we're seeing, uh, the, the trends that we've seen uh, over the last 50, 100 years. What does that mean for Wisconsin? Well, in Wisconsin, we've also been experiencing uh, warming. Uh, and so this, these, uh, what I'm gonna show are trends in, in uh, uh, temperature and precipitation uh, uh, for the various climate divisions in Wisconsin uh, since from 1950 to 2020. And so uh, what this shows is that Wisconsin is warmed by somewhere between two to three degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is similar to the, the, the global average uh, over the last uh, 70 years. Everywhere you see an asterisk is a region, is a uh, one of these uh, climate divisions is, is where that trend is, is statistically significant, meaning different than just natural variability. You wouldn't expect the, the size of this trend given the natural variability in the, in the record. Uh, here's uh, <laughs> a long-term perspective on that. This is the temperature averaged over uh, the entire state. And uh, the top panel here shows the, the daytime high temperature and the bottom panel here shows the nighttime low temperatures. And what you see is, uh, you know, there is variability. That trend is not particular, is not as evident uh, uh, here, just due to the large amounts of variability, especially in the daytime highs. Uh, and, but in the nighttime lows, uh, that trend, especially since 1950, is far more pronounced. Uh, that's something that we've observed in the historical record. And if you, if you just calculate the trends, the trends at, uh, for the, the, the winter time and the trends at night are, are larger than the trends during the day. That is consistent with our theoretical uh, understanding of how, uh, uh, of how carbon dioxide might warm our atmosphere uh, due to changes in just the changes in the, in the, in the, um, um, the forcing as well as the, the physical characteristics of the boundary layer. So while I'm not attributing this necessarily, just showing the time series doesn't necessarily say that this is due to carbon dioxide changes. Uh, there is overwhelming evidence that all when you put all of these things together, uh, either there's a lot of coincidences going on, uh, or we can we can say that uh, a lot of this trend is consistent with what we expect from from the increase in carbon dioxide. All right. What does temperature look like moving forward? That depends on how much and how fast um, uh, we we add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. I'm I'm as a let's see as a co-host. I'm seeing people in the waiting room here. Should I be admitting them or are you seeing that as well? Uh, Sorry, I don't see anyone in the waiting room. And um, we have 42 participants in the meeting. Oh, so okay. go ahead, Dan. Sorry, I see Ian Orland is in the waiting room. So. Maybe it's a different thing. Um, so, um, um, sorry. Here's that historical uh, historical temperature, and this is what model projections suggest could happen uh, in the next hundred years. This blue curve is a curve that uh, is um, a moderate emissions scenario, one that's probably pretty realistic. Uh, if there's if mitigation uh, actions are taken to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that we put into our atmosphere. And so with that blue curve, we see an additional warming of about two to eight degrees Fahrenheit by mid century and maybe uh, three to eight degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. On the other hand, this red curve is a business as usual scenario uh, for Wisconsin where um, uh, uh, globally, um, we continue to rely on a fossil fuel based economy uh, there's not much, there's not sharing of technology, uh, uh, population peaks late and at, uh, global population peaks at a high number. Uh, and that red curve then is a, uh, shows that Wisconsin will warm by somewhere between, uh, let's see here, seven to 16 uh, degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. So there's a big difference between this red curve 
and this blue curve by the end of the century. By 2050, there's not much of a difference between these two scenarios. What we do now makes an enormous difference in the long uh, term projections. And what I want to point out here, the biggest thing that I see here is by the end of the century, this red curve isn't even close to leveling off. This levels off at a, at a uh, global mean temperature that increases by 8 to 12 degrees Celsius. It's an enormous change. Uh, the blue curve uh, starts to level off, and that's important. All right, so mitigation takes us from this red curve to this blue curve. Uh, things we do to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide we're putting into the atmosphere, greenhouse gases, et cetera, brings us from this red curve to this blue curve. Even if we're able to do that, there's an, a certain amount of warming that's inevitably in the system already uh, that, that, we've, that we're committed to uh, due to the amount of carbon dioxide that we have in our atmosphere and that we will continue to emit over the next uh, uh, couple of decades. We can be planning for that already, and uh, a lot of areas of Wisconsin already are. All right, uh, the future projections, uh, just like the historical trends show that, the, the, that nighttime has been warming more than daytime uh, and winter has been warming more than summer. This is, uh, and by the way, that's, that finding is something that uh, was kind of first brought to our, uh, my attention by work that Chris uh, did uh, over a decade ago in, in looking at very carefully uh, uh, taking a look at um, data records across the state and showing uh, that, that trend uh, over a decade ago. Uh, our, our model projections, uh, which are based on things like conservation of energy and uh, uh, conservation of mass, so basic physical principles, they're not necessarily uh, tuned to uh, uh, get the observed uh, um, uh, trend correct, uh, but they do. Uh, they show that wintertime warms is expected to warm more uh, than summertime. And even though there's less warming in summer, there's still uh, important implications of that. Uh, one thing we see that with that enhanced winter warming is that extremely cold days uh, are likely to reduce in number. And so here in uh, Southern, I'm sitting in Madison right now, uh, we have about, uh, tr traditionally we get about 20 days per year where the minimum temperature is below zero degrees Fahrenheit. And that's likely to, to uh, drop quite a bit, uh, be cut in half at least. In Northern Wisconsin, it's even more drastic. And those minimum temperatures are important for uh, um, curbing the spread of invasive species, uh, they're important for ice cover. Uh, those very cold temperatures are important for uh, producing frozen ground that logging companies use to get in and out, uh, to get access to, to forests. And so logging companies are already seeing a hit to their, uh, uh, to their income uh, due to um, requirements of building new gravel roads and, and getting access to places where they ordinarily wouldn't have, uh, have to worry about the ground being unfrozen. Uh, despite the fact that summer warms less than winter, um, there is a big change in the tails of that distribution. A small change in the mean can mean a big change in the extremes. We see that with very warm day, uh, days. Currently here in Madison, southern Wisconsin, we get about 10 days per year where the temperature exceeds 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which surprised me. I always thought it would be more than that. Um, but it's only about 10 days per year. By mid-century, that's likely to triple. And that's about, the, that's about the story for most of Wisconsin. The number of extremely hot days is likely to, to approximately triple. And while hot days are uh, uh, obviously things that we, that we uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of obviously experience, uh, it's the warm nights that may be more important for things like human health or for uh, animal, uh, um, for heat stress and so forth. Hot days and humidity for heat stress especially. Uh, if you don't sleep, if it's if you if if it's warm at night, if you can't cool down at night, then it gets very hard to sleep. And if you can't sleep at night, then uh, that exacerbates all kinds of other health issues. And so nights where the temperature doesn't get below seventy degrees Fahrenheit, where it stays above seventy degrees Fahrenheit, uh, is uh, a metric that we use to uh, that that uh, public health uses as an index of uh, heat stress as well. And the the frequency of very hot nights is likely to quadruple. Um, and that's pretty much the, the story anywhere in the state. That has a special, uh, that, that especially hits communities uh, that, are, that are socially vulnerable, 
uh, uh, communities of color, uh, Native American communities, um, places uh, that uh, where um, perhaps uh, the, the social situation or the economic situation is not set up to be able to deal uh, with these kinds of, uh, of uh, this kind of heat stress. In addition to temperature, uh, Wisconsin is getting wetter, especially southern Wisconsin. Uh, in fact, precipitation in southern Wisconsin over the last 70 years has increased by more than 20% uh, over the whole state by about 20% as a whole. In fact, the, the change has been so large in southern Wisconsin that we can say it's not due to, that the, that the total amount of the change is not uh, completely attributable to climate change because the amount of precipitation increase that we've seen is more than you would expect uh, from, temperature, from the temperature change alone. Uh, when warmer air holds more moisture and uh, you expect about six degrees, uh, a six percent increase in, pre in precipitation uh, per degree Celsius of increase and we're seeing more than that. Uh, so some of this is likely natural variability. However, uh, uh, and, and we'll see in the projections that this increase in precipitation is consistent with what the projections are saying. The projections are showing less of an increase than we're actually seeing and so uh, there is a question as to why we're seeing uh, so much uh, uh, additional rainfall, whether it's due to uh, enhanced fluxes from uh, agricultural practices or whether it's due to just natural variations uh, or what. 20, uh, this last decade was Wisconsin's wettest record or wettest decade on record uh, by a long shot. Uh, I think if you go back to the 1880s, you get another, uh, uh, another decade that's pretty wet, but I think even this last decade, uh, beat out the uh, 1880s uh, for um, uh, uh, rainfall. And that's borne out in a lot of the extreme precipitation uh, that we've seen, which we'll point out here in a moment. One thing, to, one thing in terms of our future projections, one thing that the models suggest is that there's a strong seasonality to uh, the change in precipitation that we might expect. Uh, during summer, the, the, change in, the expected change in uh, precipitation uh, is somewhat uncertain. Uh, we might have more, we might have less, or uh, maybe some years we get more, some years we get less. Uh, so it says that on average, there's no change in, in, in the total amount of precipitation uh, during the summer. However, we do see increases in precipitation from fall through spring. And so thinking about the seasonality is really important, especially in terms of agricultural uh, impacts. Seasonality of precipitation, rain on ground that's frozen or ground that's just become uh, just unfreezing, uh, and there's also potential impacts there to uh, planting, to the ability to plant. Uh, if, if even though we may have a longer frost, uh, frost-free season, and I don't know if Chris will talk more about this, but even if we have a longer frost-free season, uh, if the ground is, is saturated, it may not uh, tra translate to a longer growing season. Uh, despite the fact that summer precipitation, that the mean precipitation uh, is, uh, shows um, little change or uh, uncertain changes, one thing that is consistently seen across the models is that extreme precipitation is likely to become uh, more frequent or more extreme. That's two ways of saying the same thing. Um, and in fact, if we look in the last decade, Wisconsin has experienced uh, more than 20 100-year rainfall events uh, across the state in the last decade. Uh, certainly uh, here in uh, southern Wisconsin, I think it was 2018, the, the, um, the flooding in Cross Plains where we received about 14 inches of rain in a 24-hour period uh, out by Middleton. Northern Wisconsin has gotten hit hard, uh, and certainly the Driftless area in west, uh, southwestern Wisconsin has gotten hit hard as well uh, this last decade. Uh, those extreme rainfall events. Uh, one thing uh, that has come out of the research recently is that the really, really extreme events, the 500 year, the thousand year events, things that are hard to characterize even, uh, are changing much more rapidly than uh, your garden variety extreme event, you know, the, the three or four inch event. Um, uh, and, and there's uh, new research that suggests that that might be, uh, con that that's consistent with what we might expect from warming climate and changing thresholds that go along with that warming climate. Our model projections show the same thing, that extreme precipitation is likely to increase. 
Uh, and so just like, uh, again, you know, the, our models are not tuned to, uh, to reproduce the historical time period, uh, but looking into the future based on principles like conservation of energy, basic uh, physical principles, our models suggest uh, that what we're seeing in the historical record are consistent at least with what uh, uh, carbon dioxide will, will cause for future uh, climate change. All right, I think I, I think I had 20 minutes. Uh, and so uh, I'm gonna wrap up here. Uh, historical trends, uh, we are getting warmer and we're getting wetter. Uh, nighttime is warming more than day, winter warms more than summer. Uh, but the impacts, even though summer may not be warming as much as winter, the impacts uh, are unique to each season. I think it's really useful to think of these seasonal uh, and diurnal uh, changes. And I'll, I'll point that in a second. In the future, Wisconsin will continue to warm no matter what we do on a global scale. The question is how much and how fast are we willing to accept? Uh, how much climate change are we willing to accept? And how fast are we willing to allow it to occur? Um, uh, the, the moderate range scenario suggests that Wisconsin will warm another two to eight degrees uh, Fahrenheit um, in the next, say, 30 years. Uh, and we could potentially curb it at that um, by uh, it with, with mitigation efforts. Either way, we can be adapting and should be. And a lot of people already are. Um, model projections uh, based, on, uh, based on physical principles are consistent with the historical trends that we've seen. When we're thinking about the impacts of climate change, it's worth thinking about uh, the seasonality, I think. Um, the, the comment I made about longer growing season, uh, warmer summer nights, uh, warmer summer days and warmer summer nights, nights warm more than days, um, could lead to changes in the diurnal variation in, in the vapor pressure deficit, which may have impacts for agriculture as well. The other thing that's worth thinking about are compound impacts. What happens if we get hit with an extreme heat wave that extends over a much larger region than we're used to? Uh, the, the impacts to the energy infrastructure are very different there. Or extreme heat and humidity, which leads to a higher heat index, which, which uh, can be, uh, which is a better predictor for uh, heat stress in, in, uh, for, for dairy and so forth. All right, thanks everyone. Um, I'm happy to answer some questions in the chat bar, um, but I uh, encourage you if you have uh, questions to uh, type them in and we'll address them uh, after Chris's uh, presentation as well. Thank you for a great presentation, Dan. Uh, there are some wonderful questions in the chat bar. And you not only conveyed a lot of data really clearly, but you did it all exactly on time. So <laughs> it's the uh, first time that's ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> So we actually have uh, a couple minutes. Uh, I don't know if you want to take the, the last question from Bill Clace first, which is perhaps the most challenging one. Uh, he asks uh, what the source is for your temp minimum and maximum temperature data and why you chose those time periods. Yes, um, I'm using the uh, I'm using the uh, the NOAA NCLIMDIV data, which is the data that's been curated by. Um, uh, so this is this is data that's collected, I think, through the co-op observation network, which is citizens around the state who are collecting this data. It's then compiled by, um, uh, I think, NESDIS, NOAA NESDIS. Um, or the National Climatic Data Center, which may be in, in NESDIS. I'm, I'm terrible with remembering bureaucratic structures, so forgive me on that. But it's the NCLIMDIV data, which is the, which is the standard, uh, the, the, the US standard for that. Uh, I will say that uh, the, this is consistent with the findings that Chris Kucherik uh, compiled uh, a decade ago using the Cooperative Observer Network in Wisconsin, which is just our neighbors heading out, measuring temperature, uh, and in the morning, the maximum and minimum temperature and precip and collecting that and providing a data set that is critical for our country. Uh, so, um, you know, hoorah to, to, to that, absolutely. Um, why did I choose? Right, uh, 1981 to 2010 is, is what's defined as the quote, climate normal. Uh, and so one of the things that we, we've done rather than go from 19, rather than use a 1950 to 1999 average, um, I've updated the, the, the climate normal to be consistent with national standards for that. That's why I'm using the 1981 to uh, 2010 data. If you go back to 1950 to 1999, the numbers don't change that much in terms of the projected change. There'll be a little bit more change just due to the fact that 
you're going a little back back a little farther in time. We choose 1950 as a starting point for the historical trends because that's when the data becomes really um, a little more uh, uniformly distributed and uh, the quality controls a little better. And Chris can address that a little bit. He's actually uh, dived into the weeds on some of this. Uh, we've done uh, a lot of analysis of, of things in that data set that you want to be real careful of, like making sure that the hour of observation, uh, that, that when it was actually recorded, uh, makes a difference. And so we've, we've had to ensure uh, in all of our analyses uh, that uh, we, we've developed objective techniques uh, to um, uh, actually predict when these cooperative observers were going out and actually measuring uh, uh, the, the high and low temperature. Uh, and uh, we actually uh, uh, can predict that better than their actual recording of when they took it, um, which uh, sometimes people forget to change their observation practices. Uh, and so we make sure and incorporate all that stuff into, into the, the future projections and the downscaling data that we use for that. Um, we, and so uh, showing that data back to 1900, I do that for the long-term perspective. So just as you suggest, absolutely. Uh, we, we do show it back to 1900 and you can see that, that that warming is consistent. It's not like we're, you know, grabbing a particularly cold uh, time period, so. Great, okay. great. Well, we do have other great questions, but I do want to transition. Um, while we are transitioning to the next speaker, and uh, Chris can go ahead and, and pull up his slides if he wants, but I am going to ask all of you who are watching to fill out the demographic poll that we all know and love for our reporting. So take a minute to do that uh, while I am introducing uh, Dr. Kucharik. Chris is a professor and the chair of the agronomy department at UW-Madison. And he's also the co-lead of the Agriculture Working Group of the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts. And I know many of you are familiar with that initiative. We call it Wiki for short. Uh, but at the end, if there's time and if people have questions, I'm sure both Dan and Chris will be happy to talk about what Wiki is and uh, what that initiative is, is working on right now. So uh, without any further ado, Chris, uh, take it away. Thanks, Diane. And um, before I get started, I just wanted to make a follow-up comment on the question that Dan had answered regarding the, the time series and starting in 1950 a little bit. And you know, really, when I did the analyses you know, a decade ago, uh, we looked at you know the number of stations available, and as you go start to go before 1950, the number of co-op stations starts to drop off considerably in Wisconsin, unfortunately. So then you're you're tasked with making a decision and what to defend best. You know, people start saying, "Oh, you you drew trends from data when there were only 30 stations around the state, and you've interpolated you know to a, a certain spatial grid." So that that's part of it too. But we we're very blessed to have a very dense network of co-op observers, uh, you know, over the last 50, 60, 70 years now. So thanks, Dan, for uh, being the opening act, although I must say um, it's it's fun again to be back together and, and talk in climate change. And we're still doing it 10 years later. Oh, don't have this problem solved. So let's get into it. Um, the first thing was Diane had asked if I could do just a quick, you know, overview of the greenhouse gas emission contributions from ag, and this is at the U.S. scale, um, and I got this data from the EPA's website, and it's about 10 percent. You'll hear var variations of that number um, from time to time, um, and it's largely in agriculture due to soil management, uh, enteric fermentation, and manure management. And crop and soils and, and their management and livestock have both gone up over the last um, 30 years or so, but fuel combustion um, has decreased um, uh, during that same time period. So, and then largely, you know, in the upper right here, the, you know, the contributions of the, the major greenhouse gases, that's largely CO2, but remember that nitrous oxide and methane are on a molecule by molecule basis, much more efficient at serving as greenhouse um, gases. So even though they're rising in a smaller um, absolute value, their, their contribution is, is bigger on a molecule basis. 
All right. So I just wanted to review a little bit, and it's really hard to do, you know, in, <laughs> in just a 20 minute talk, you know, how does weather and climate actually impact agriculture? And the first thing to remember is that weather, which is the short term variability, and climate, which is the long term trends that, that Dan was talking about, those are both important to ag. Obviously, you know, the, the daily to seasonal variability is very important for planning and daily management. But in terms of planning for the long term, whether it's capital investments, um, how, you know, are you going to adapt? Or are you going to do something differently that requires a lot of financial resources? Those are things that need more planning. And that's why it's important to pay attention to these, as well as to the livelihood of agriculture within a state that brings tens of billions of dollars of economic activity each year. So it has a lot, you know, it impacts production, as you probably all know, what we're choosing to grow and what the different varieties are. Um, Dan had mentioned, you know, a bit about impacts on livestock functioning and how they're managed, how we manage our water, our fertilizer, other agrochemicals, how we till, how when we plant, when we harvest, what types of equipment we're using, um, the types of pests and diseases that we, we might experience, as well as weed and crop interactions, which are both impacted by both CO2 in the atmosphere, as well as the weather and the climate. And then organic matter cycling, um, leaching of nutrients, which I'll talk quite a bit about. But you know, in Wisconsin, ag is diverse. We're not Iowa. We don't have 80% 80, 80 of our landscape isn't just corn and beans. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some examples um, to, to show you how the ramifications are very diverse, um, but very, very uh, important. So this is just a, a bit of a summary, which is you know getting to be outdated ten years later, but I still like it because it just sort of summarizes um, you know the overall projection. Some of these will change a little bit as we you know get to updating it as part of Wiki, but we've heard about increases in temperature, the increases in annual precip, an extension of the growing season, increase of very hot days. Um, frequency of very cold days going down and then sort of the, the increase of extreme rainfall events going up. And, you know, in agriculture, you might point to an extended growing season actually would bring some benefits. And, and there is some truth to that. If you look further to the South and Illinois and, and Iowa and Indiana, the core of the Corn Belt, their yields for corn and beans are higher than what we get in Southern Wisconsin and they're warmer there. Um, so there's certain crops that are likely to continue to, to do okay and do better, but there's others that are gonna be met with other challenges uh, due to warming temperatures. And then there's a whole host of other things that everybody is challenged by as we see more rainfall and an increase in, in the extreme rainfall events, which is another theme of, of the story I give today. So given those future projections that you know have been outlined, what are some of the key challenges? And, the first question I usually get asked or is brought up in, in class is students are always focused on its heat. More heat is bad. And a lot of the, you know, stories that have gotten a lot of attention in the more popular press and that um, have to do with extreme heat and the role that it has on corn. And that's important, but it's not the only story. Um, but unfortunately, it often gets the broad headlines. And this is just a sampling of, of some of the the uh, publications I have students read and then the classes that I, I teach when we start getting into these impacts. But think about extending out the current trends uh, for corn and soybean yields. And this is for Wisconsin. Slide's a little outdated with the data, but bear with me. The story doesn't really change. If you start projecting out, you know, the annual increase in, in yields by about one to one and a half percent per year, you get that straight line and assume that, you know, yields will continue. But if you think about the impacts of extreme heat from a physiological basis and stress on plants, that it might be extreme heat or it might be more drought, that projected trend to 2050 that Dan had outlined, you know, which is from IPCC and, and Wiki, you start to knock down that overall trend line unless some type of adaptive measures are taken. Now that might happen from breeding, plant breeding and genetics. It might happen through you know, a certain extension of the growing season. It might happen through irrigating your crops more. But if we do nothing based on past literature, that's basically the type of you know, trend or 
get to the trend that we might see. But there's a whole host of other challenges that often don't get a lot of attention or didn't probably until about the last five to eight years when we started getting 45 to 50 inches of rainfall every year. Um, in particular, the, the impact on managing things like nitrogen and phosphorus. You can imagine increased variability and, and more rainfall is making it harder to keep nutrients where they need to stay in the soil and not leaching out and getting into our groundwater or running off the surface into our surface waterways. The impacts on water management are gonna go up and be, you know, we're gonna be challenged by increased maybe crop water demand, more chaotic rainfall patterns, heavier rainfall events. Farmers have already been dealing with this. Um, those types of impacts uh, trickle down into soil management, more erosion, uh, more tillage operations. Dan was pointing out, you know, an extension of the growing season and, and maybe we can have earlier planting dates, but I'll say, you know, we, we have seen a trend up until about 2010 towards earlier planting in spring, which wasn't necessarily all due to warming of springtime, but that trend has effectively gone away um, with more rainfall and more chaotic sort of weather patterns in spring, it's becoming more difficult for farmers to get out into wet fields and drive tractors over without compacting the soil and, and ruining soil structure. We've also would be challenged by, you know, more overwintering and expanded, expanded ranges of certain pests and disease, some of those which don't exist right now in Wisconsin, and that will continue to move further north, you know, from points to the south. There's a worry about, as I had mentioned, you know, temperatures moving outside the optimum physiological ranges for photosynthesis. We grow, you know, soybean is a, a C3 uh, plant, which is a basically a cooler season form of how photosynthesis uh, goes about its business. We have other specialty crops in the central sands like potato, um, where I'm particularly concerned about how temperatures continuing to warm might start to stress those plants more and more as, as time goes on. Um, increased warming also increases the rate of plant development or what we call phenology. And um, that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, we have the likelihood of earlier onset of spring and the higher frequency of false springs as they're called. Uh, you might remember the spring of 2012, uh, March, we saw two weeks straight of about 80 degrees or more. And we had, uh, you know, apples going into bloom and all sorts of crazy things happening due to that fall spring. And what happened about four weeks later, we had the expected killing frost and freeze, and it decimated the cherry and apple industry that year, unfortunately, as well as maybe played havoc with your own plants in your yard. Um, Warming temperatures will increase soil moisture stress due to a more evaporative water demand. Uh, number nine here, you know, increased atmospheric CO2. We hear a lot about it, you know, and I'd say 20 years ago when I started studying these interactions, it was called CO2 fertilization. This is going to be a, a good thing. And as, as time has gone on, you know, we've learned that it, it could offset some negative impacts uh, for some crops but it also allows certain weeds to flourish. Weeds also like increased CO2, and that starts to put um, more pressure on management of those. Um, and, uh, you know, just a small story, I know there's probably some weed extension folks on this call. When I joined agronomy in 2009, I was wondering, why do we have three or four people just studying weeds, you know? And I was very naive about this topic, but soon realized how much of a problem it is and how much it could get worse, you know, as, as climate and, and CO2 continues to change. So we've talked about, you know, more challenging planting and harvest seasons. In winter, maybe more rain falling on frozen ground and, and more runoff occurring. And then one of the, the interesting questions with a lengthening growing season would be, how do you adapt? Do you going to plant a longer summer crop variety like they do in Illinois, let's say, that has a longer growing season, or given cover crops have a hard time getting established due to the abrupt end of the growing season and transitioning into winter, will you take advantage of another two or three weeks of warmer temperatures 
and actually start to plant cover crops more often, which would be a, a benefit to a, a lot of soil and, and water resource management issues we have facing us right now. So just, you know, as an example, and I'll take on the central sands because that's where all my field research and, and other activities seem to be going on right now. But you can think of a, a growing season being three weeks longer in a region like that. Average maximum temperatures during the summer being several degrees, degrees higher, about 30 days each year in the 90s versus the seven or so that they typically see right now. Dan had mentioned that, that tripling effect in, in those hot days. Um, growing season humidity increasing to a value that resembles the most humid days uh, currently. Increased precip, but maybe less frequent rainfall events, um, depending on how that all plays out. And therefore, when it rains, it rains harder with a higher likelihood of runoff or water quickly moving past the root zone before plants can use it. And in, the, in sandy soils, that's a, a very big problem, unfortunately given the texture of the, the soil and, and challenges with that. Some other stories that you know, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but maybe the general public doesn't hear that often about, think about Wisconsin cranberries and other fruit crops. They face a really uncertain future. Um, a lot of management challenges. Uh, fruit crops require chilling units, as we call them, uh, during winter. Um, and cranberry in particular needs ice formation, uh, not only protect beds, but um, as far as I understand, drive vehicles over that ice during winter and spread sand, which then replenishes the beds um, after the ice comes off. And, and so, you know, cranberry in Wisconsin, these stats here, 50% or greater than 50% of the world supply 1 billion in annual revenue, but that production's on only 21,000 acres and 250 farms in the state. It's such a concentrated area. It's not like spread out over a large region that you can sort of hedge your bets and hope from one year to the next that, okay, maybe one, this person has a bad year or region and this other region has a better year. It's kind of like an all or nothing thing, which puts you know, that industry in a pretty precarious position, unfortunately. And we're already on the Southern range or fringe of, of the most ideal conditions uh, for growing some of these. And just a quote that uh, Jed had here that I picked up on one of these stories that it's one of the most intensively managed and monitored crops that we have. So you can imagine how heavy rainfall and more freeze thaw cycles and lack of ice and fewer cold nights and how this would really wreak havoc um, with these types of cropping systems. Dan mentioned quite a bit about the impacts to, to heat stress and livestock and um, I just drew some circles around the approximate sort of combination of average heat and humidity um, during those particular times, you know, over the next um, basically 80 years. Um, so, you know, average conditions today where, you know, we might have alert days, you know, during certain times of the summer start to push in the danger and emergency category pretty quickly and almost on a daily basis um, if the climate continues to go uh, the way that it has been. So nutrient pollution, I think is, this is the one thing that, you know, if I could have predicted 20 years ago, I'd be spending all of my time on basically, I'd be like, wow, that I would be surprised, but it is. Um, and it is, is because we, we have a significant challenge with agricultural management and, and trying to find ways to, to prevent this from ha happening. So it's either, you know, the runoff and surface waterways, or it's, going into the groundwater, which has been getting a lot of attention during the last few years. Um, and, you know, part of this is doing, um, you know, I'm not blaming agriculture. It's, you know, just the fact of the challenges of, of farming. And, you know, I'm picking on corn here is that there's a lot of time during the year when there's no, you know, nutrient uptake from the soil and you have a high potential for leaching or loss of that end that's stored in soils and, and corn only takes up on average about 50% of the fertilizer that is stored. And so if you, you put that together with the changes in, in rainfall and extreme events, you can see it's, it's not a very good recipe for, for getting, uh, getting better or improving water quality. Um, you know, there's been a lot of studies that have looked at the intersection um, 
of you know where land use is you know in Wisconsin with agricultural uh, land use as well as where the highest amount of nitrate is found in our, our groundwater supply. Um, and the stat here is about 20% of samples exceed 10 milligrams per liter, which is the EPA limit for safe drinking water, um, when more than 75% of the land area around it is cultivated. So we, we know there's a connection there. One other thing I wanna draw your attention to in these maps is that if you go back and looked at some of the maps that Dan had shown in terms of the extreme rainfall events and where they're more likely to be occurring, sort of the, the southern and western two thirds of the state, those unfortunately land right on top of where our most pronounced agricultural land is found in the state. So some other um, you know, challenges, uh, this gets down into the, the weeds you know, a little bit more. Warming temperatures can promote more rapid decomposition of litter that's going back to the soil, which can make more nitrogen available. Um, warmer temperatures during winter promote more freeze-thaw cycles, more rain during winter. You know, all these things can promote more drainage and loss of nitrogen stored in, in soils. So this is, you know, sort of an intersecting challenge, you know, too much nitrogen, too much phosphorus in our systems, increasing rainfall, extreme weather, and just making nutrient management much more challenging. Um, so what has been the response of farmers, you know, to these wetter conditions? You know, people often say, what, can you tell me some things that you feel have happened due to a changing climate and how farmers have responded to that? And there's not a lot of data that I can show, um, but there are a few few examples. And you know, the, the first thing you know is that some of these stories suggest you know we're we're losing the type of climate that is basically beneficial to agriculture. And how are we going to adapt? And how are we going to increase resiliency through time? And um, you know, the story is the same one I've been talking about. You know, as I mentioned before, for over the last decade. So let's just pick on Madison's precip trend and just look at you know, those dots on the graph. Each dot represents a 30 year average, basically the climatology for the last 30 years of the annual precipitation. So Madison's precip has increased about 23% in the last 50 years. And you can see you know, with the ranking here, you know, when these wettest years you know, have generally happened. And, and Dan is right, the early 1880s had a string of several years that also fall in the top 10 as being the wettest on record. Um, I don't know if we can learn anything from, from sort of a parallel to that and what was going on there. But in any case, this has really challenged farming in the last decade. And this wonderful photo op that I had uh, with Madison Magazine a couple of years ago, standing in front of a flooded field out on Highway 51 near Arlington, is that the groundwater levels have come up to the point that we've created these new lakes in the landscape. And that wet period kind of started around 2008. You might remember that June, uh, Lake Delton was breached. Houses were washing down the Wisconsin River. Um, a lot of these fields hadn't recovered since that, that time period and had just been getting worse and worse, which has created a lot of prevent plant. Basically farmers have not been able to get crops in uh, before the deadline you know, for, for, ins for insured crops. And, um, and that's been going up as a trend over, I'd say over the last five to 10 years. We're putting in more tile drainage to deal with more water. Um, Wisconsin's not a leader, but if you look further to the south, challenges with certain soil types, more heavy rainfall on that is sort of a, a prelude to the types of things that Wisconsin farmers are going to be dealing with more often. And then lastly, adding more nitrogen fertilizer to make up for the risk of more leaching. This is the one that that bothers me the most because it's a double negative, unfortunately. So farmers basically are feeling because of that loss of nitrogen due to more rainfall, they need to put more nitrogen on the system, um, which then increases the odds that it's likely to, to leach through and then not be taken up by the plant. Um, that's just unfortunate, you know, and it's farmers have to do what they need to do to, to protect their crops. And, and that is one response that we know is, has been happening. And we know there won't be quick fixes to the water quality problems due to the legacy effect of nitrogen in the system, as well as a changing climate will prevent 
you know, rapid progress from really happening. So one of the key challenges when people ask, you know, well, what, what do we need to be doing is the problem is that we have an absence of analogs in the historical record to point to and be like, well, this year was like such and such, and here's what may have worked better or, or worse in that given year. And, and the whole adage of stationarity is dead is that in future planning, the amount of historical daily and interannual variability that was typically helpful years ago is now useless. It's just we're just outside those extremes um, from a historical perspective to help in planning. And that's not gonna change anytime soon. So what are some of the things that, that people are, you know, might try to do to adapt and increase resiliency? Um, you hear a lot about conservation tillage and cover crops to prevent more erosion of soils. Regenerative agriculture practices fit in there also and adopting those more perennials across the landscape, like in the picture uh, behind the text there, more rotational grazing, basically transforming a lot of the agricultural system in a traditional sense of, of what we've been doing to something a bit different. Um, how can you diversify you know, hybrids and varieties? Think about new crop types or different rotations. Um, in genetics, you know, colleagues in, in my department are continually doing experiments trying to figure out how to select for new plant traits that increase water use efficiency, nitrogen use efficiency, um, basically get more out of what you, you know out of what you put in. Um, there's a lot to do with uh, supporting research to help identify technology precision ag, you know, that works and, and doesn't work. And you know, the final point is to be aware of what trends are happening, and um, basically just be be aware of what, what we have to say and, and what the message is. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, and I know I'm probably over 20, so it's good that I be quiet now. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. Again, a great presentation. And we set both of you kind of an impossible task to put this incredibly interesting and incredibly complex information in 20 minutes. Uh, Dan has been busily answering questions in the chat, um, but there are some questions that Dan hasn't gotten to yet and that are, I think, aimed particularly at your presentation. Um, and one of them is uh, the relationship between here, the questions are coming in. So what is the relationship between the extra uh, nitrogen being put on the land for fertilizer and the amount of nitrates in wells and health issues? And I would kind of add also, and between nitrous oxide emissions from soils, particularly with wet weather. Sure. Um, so I think, you know, the question just pointing out that, you know, the, we know that, you know, ag unfortunately is contributing to, you know, that increase in, in nitrates and in, in our drinking water, you know, to the point that there's some wells in the central sands region that are at about 40 to 45 parts per million or four times the recommended amount. Um, data we've collected the last three field seasons puts the average on an, an average well in the central sands around 20 parts per million. What we'd like to see happen, and obviously those have you know significant impacts on, on human health and, and whether or not you need to treat your water or can drink it at all. Um, is to start getting folks to make sure they're accounting for the nitrate and groundwater when they're managing their crops. You know, in the central sands, they're irrigating every other day to every third day, whether it's potatoes, sweet corn, peas, or, or whatever. So uh, we're hoping that, that that can can help and maybe reduce the amount of fertilizer that actually is going across uh, the landscape. Thanks. Um, well, and what about the, the nitrous oxide emissions from oh, soils? Yeah. yeah. So we also know that, you know, the through the, and I don't want to go through all the stoichiometry and that, but the, uh, you know, nitrogen that goes on as fertilizer can also be um, transitioned to nitrous oxide. And there is a, a, a significant correlation between the amount of fertilizer going on and the amount of nitrous oxide that comes off, unfortunately. Um, it's, it, I guess it, it's a small amount when you think about the total amount of N that's going on, but 
Again, nitrous oxide is a more potent greenhouse gas. Great. Well, there's so many questions here. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, let's see. Kat just had a comment that cranberries, in addition to be, being one of our most important industries, are also highly polluting. Um, so I think that was just more in the nature of a comment. Um, let's see. Jean had a question about uh, whether the soil ecosystem matters. Are fungal dominated soil ecosystems from long-term no-till more nitrogen efficient than bacterial dominated fields that we typically see under our tilled crops? Uh, and I'm outside my comfort zone on answering uh, that one, but um, I, I'll I'll just say that you know there is some some evidence there. I just I don't know if we know enough yet, and if the you know the data is is widespread or, or not. And I'm speaking from a, a modeling perspective and and how I model soil biogeochemistry. And 20 years ago, when I started working in that that area. You know, we were thinking, well, this black box that we call microbes in the model, eventually we will have separate categories that do different things and respond differently to uh, temperature and moisture or, or certain types of management practices. I still have one black box. I, I don't have enough data to fill out what those other boxes are and what they do, unfortunately. Uh, we need probably another 10 Thea Whitmans in the Soil Science Department here at UW-Madison to answer all those questions. I, and I know she's overwhelmed and is a very important person in soil microbial ecology. So um, we have a ways to go, but I think if Thea was here, she would say we made some progress, but definitely not enough. Well, there are two questions I'd love to open up uh, to both of you. Um, and then I think I'm rather than me trying to curate these questions in the chat, I, I, I'll invite people to unmute themselves. But the the one the most recent question asked, which I think is it will be very interesting, both from a question of agriculture and just generally, are there climate analogs for what we think Wisconsin's weather will be, say, between 2050 and then and um, the next the next century um and uh are there are there insights in terms of what kind of crop adaptations we could have yeah hello arkansas or missouri i mean those are usually the two that are are pointed at um and i'm accepting of that and dan will probably has his own take on this but even so it, it's hard to to pick a region and and you know you classify maybe mean temperature and mean seasons and, and how those might change because they're like those other places. But day to day, week to week variability, it's, I think, very hard to pick one particular region and find a suitable analog, especially given what we've just gone through in the last 10 years or so. I don't know, Dan, what do you what do you think about that? I, I agree with you. I think, uh, you know, the long term, you're right. Uh, you know, by the end of the century, southern Missouri, Arkansas, uh, you know, mid-century, uh, we're looking at uh, Illinois, uh, mid-southern Illinois. Um, it, it, is a, it is hard to come up with a direct analog. And, and uh, you know, this is something, uh, so Ian, thanks for the question there. Uh, it is something that uh, Jack Williams has looked at and trying to incorporate variability as well. And, you know, I just don't think we have a... Um, um, I think those are reasonable. Those are reasonable things to do. Is to is to say, okay, what 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 practices exist in you know, Illinois right now that that might be that we might be able to learn from? Um, will it look exactly like Illinois? No, but uh, is it a good analog? Sure, we can learn from we can learn from that. All right. Well, then the other question I'd love both of you to to talk about, and I'm kind of combining a couple of comments in the chat here. Um, which are kind of how can we respond to this and uh, in particular within agriculture and Jean kind of asked the question that we are seeing a change in the farming community and more broadly in local policy of willingness to 
discuss climate impacts and, and look at soil health, but are the changes we're seeing, the interest in cover crops, possibly a little bit of, well, a lot of interest in soil health and a little bit of activity, um, the interest precedes, we hope more activity. Are those enough or do we need much more drastic action? Both for resilience and adaptation and then potentially also for mitigation. Yeah, well, I think we need much more drastic, drastic outside the box thinking and adaptation. I, I mean, I, I, it's easy for me to sit here and point fingers, but a lot of the small changes or like implementation of better management practices and, and other things that have, and a lot of money that's been invested has not done much for increasing resiliency or making water quality improve that, you know, over the last several decades. It, and it, it's easy to see that when you do back of the envelope calculations on just simple budgets for either nitrogen or phosphorus or how much soil is lost due to erosion. Um, so, you know, as I ventured more into trying to connect science to policy, it's, you know, trying to find um, a starting point where, where farmers can buy into an idea. And I think the problem is we can't, we can't come up with the final answer and say, here, do this next year. It's, it's gotta be a target 10, 15, 20 years down the road so they can gradually adapt. So it's not immediate, hurts them so, so much that they just abandon the farm and, and sell the land and that. Um, so I don't know, Dan, go, go ahead. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I, uh, I was just going to look up the, um, um, so right now, uh, it, it, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to speak directly to ag, uh, in, in this case, but just to give you a perspective in terms of greenhouse gas emissions by economic sector, uh, about a quarter of, uh, over a quarter. So about 30% of greenhouse gas emissions comes from transportation. Uh, I think it's in the U.S. About 30% comes from electrical generation, 20% uh, from industry, and then um, another 10% from commercial residential, and then 10% uh, from agriculture. And so it gives you kind of, there's no one sector that we can point to and say, all right, ag, if you fix your, <laughs> you, you fix this then we're, you know, we're in the clear or all right, transportation, if we, if we convert our entire vehicle fleet in the US to renewable electric uh, powered vehicles, you know, we get 30% of the way there, right? I mean, this is, this is the kind of scale of things that we need to be, that we need to be talking about. And I know that it sounds very, you know, I always feel like, you know, uh, what was it like, what's the biblical story, Jonah in Nineveh or something <laughs> coming through it? Uh, but, uh, um, you know, it sounds, it sounds enormous, but the other, the other side of this is that we have no idea what our world is going to look like in 30 years. And anybody who tells you otherwise is, 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 uh, Nostradamus in this case, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's entirely possible that we could move completely away from, uh, carbon-based, uh, um, fuel, um, uh, it is possible that renewables may become so cheap and already renewables are cheap enough that it's more economic to invest in, in, in renewable energy sources than, than uh, uh, in, in say coal fired power plants in Wisconsin. And you're seeing energy companies moving that way. Um, you know, so, so there's, we, you know, I just saw something yesterday about uh, developing um, batteries that, that are load supporting so that you can, you can make the frame of a, of an automobile out of a battery, which changes things completely because now you have very lightweight cars and you don't have the, the, the energy requirements, you know, there's a uh, uh, quantum computing where instead of using electrons, which to, to you know, power my smartphone here, uh, instead of using those flipping back and forth, which is, which takes mass, uh, we can do massless, uh, we can do massless uh, computations, which is going to fundamentally change the way that information technology uses uh, energy. And so we, we really don't know how things are going to evolve, but we know that if we stick on this, on the path of let's just stick with what we're doing, that none of that's going to happen. 
And so, you know, we, we need to be thinking ahead. We need, there need to be incentives to try and be developing these kinds of, of uh, economic and, and, and technological breakthroughs to, to try and uh, um, uh, move our world in a direction uh, of less emissions. So that, that's a total punt on your question. Uh, but it's, you know, it gives you, it gives you a scale of the, the, uh, of, of what we, of what's at stake here. I mean, it's not a, there's no one fix. Uh, there's no easy fix. Uh, and, and it's, it's daunting to look at this and say that we need to fundamentally change our entire global society. But on the other hand, we're already doing it every day. Our, our society is changing so much. And so, uh, we need to be thinking about how we, we nudge things in ways that, that move in good directions. I don't know if that's. Well, you may not have answered this specific question or provided a list of specific actions in agriculture, but I think that was really helpful. And I really like the framing of, which I think is a really important point to make that it's not helpful to say another sector has to solve the problem because every single sector has to work on this. So agriculture has to address its issues, but obviously, agriculture could do everything perfectly and unless transportation and electricity generation do their part. Right. And similarly, the transportation and electricity generation could do, their, could do everything. And, yeah. Or, you know, the U.S. could go to zero emissions, but if no one else does, or, or China can go to zero emissions, but if the U.S. doesn't. And so it's, right. it's this, right. this. But we can't, problem. you know, we can't all wait for the other person to go ahead because then we're all completely it's, out it's of luck. Um, game theory. Uh. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So let's avoid our prisoner's dilemma. Um, yes, lots more good questions. Uh, I do want to be mindful of people's time. And I see that some people have already dropped off. I know people have other commitments. Uh, there uh, was a question from Kat, which is, you know, probably outside of your specific technical expertise. But if you have thoughts on what the specific role of extension educators can be, in, in climate change issues in Wisconsin. Well, I think you, Diane and Kevin, probably already know my answer. Um, <laughs> we need folks more than just Dan and I out there communicating. Um, as Dan pointed out, when we did the road show a decade ago, my, my mentors on my tenure committee said, you can't do 29 invited talks again next year. Um, you don't have an extension appointment. I'm like, well, what do you mean? I can't do outreach? And they're like, that's a lot. That's, you know, you're, you're bordering. I'm like, well, how do we get that information out there? But, you know, having, you know, your team and folks involved with Wiki and, and getting to the point where you're comfortable with giving a talk like what Dan and I just gave, which you can do. Dan and I are not rocket scientists. We got our head in the clouds once in a while, but um, this, um, this is a pretty clear message that I, I think um, needs needs to get in the hands of more extension folks so they can multiply and get it out to more people. Yeah. Yes, and Dan already responded to Jean's question about whether you're open to sharing your slides. And so I'm I'm thinking that possibly that would that would help extension agents if if we, you know, if, if you can also share your slides because then we don't have to invent that anew. Um, I, I'm going to invite people to open up and ask questions verbally at this point. There are some other questions in the chat, but uh, I think we're, we're 10 minutes over our time. And I, I'd love this to get a little informal for those who are, who are diehard still hanging in there. That sounds good. And obviously, yeah, Dan and Chris, if you have to leave, you know, you have done your duty. I, I scheduled a little extra time, so we're fine. Uh, I do want to address that cat's uh, question as well, and I think it's I think extension is is just critical, not only for you know not only for bandwidth issues. I mean, I've 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 said no to as many talks as I've been invited to since January first, and I've already this is my seventh I think since January first, and my second today. Uh, so it's uh, you know it, there, there's a lot. <laughs> uh, um, but the flip side of that also is that the, you know, the extension is trusted in uh, on the ground. You know, me coming somewhere and saying, "Hey, everybody, this is this is happening," is is back to Jonah and the you know Jonah and Nineveh, uh, right? That uh, who's this Yahoo coming in from uh, Zivory Tower and telling me what to do? 
Whereas the person that, that develops those relationships and, and research shows that it's that one-on-one -on -one interaction that really gets people to start thinking about things. You know, if I come in and I just, you know, spout off some information, people will just, uh, it's a lot easier to just say, that's him. It, it's not, it's not my, my trusted resource in this. And so, you know, I'd love to see it. The other thing I'd love to see is a, a strong state climatology office with a strong connection to UW Extension. And that's something that, you know, Kat and I have talked about in the past before, so. Yeah, yeah. Great, well, you're getting agreement in the chat from people, <laughs> we, we like that message. So Anybody who wants that? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I put it in the chat, but um, I'm wondering what, uh, to, to get at two issues, which is, getting the methane out of the air and also getting the um, nitrogen out of the ground water and, in, and the water system altogether. Um, anaerobic digestion is really a, a way to go, especially in, in dairy um, livestock. And I'm wondering, um, because I don't work, I'm a state specialist, so I don't work with the ag community. And I don't know farmers' opinions of this. Are they concerned about their the impacts of nitrogen other than obviously they're regulated? But um, what would it take to get them to be doing, um, you know, anaerobic digestion um, and, and putting in, you know, that type of composting and, and creating, you know, renewable natural gas like they're doing in Dane County where, you know, Joe Parisi has seen that connection between water quality in our lakes and and um, and farms, uh, farm runoff, and uh, is allowing their um, their natural gas to go and you know get refined and go into their RNG pipelines to get sold. That's a. I'll let Chris take the uh, the digestion <laughs> part of that. The. Uh, uh, you know, Dane County is an, is a, is a good example. On the other hand, uh, what I like about the Dane County example is that, uh, some creative people took a look at their situation and realized there was an immense economic opportunity there. And, uh, that pipeline happened to be running directly under the landfill or something. So, uh, it, it made it so that you could do something like that. Those kinds of win-win situations exist all over the place though. And it, it requires, uh, creative people looking and and looking for opportunities. Uh, so I really like like that example in that sense. As for you know the the broad, uh, I'll, I'm going to punt to Chris on that because I know nothing about <laughs> about digesters. Yeah, and I I don't want to speak too much on it if someone else on this call knows <clears throat> a little more about the economics <clears throat> of digesters and and that. I could, I could contribute a bit. Uh, I toured uh, in Germany and Netherlands uh, two years ago with the professional dairy producers of Wisconsin. And there's certainly uh, a lot of farm scale uh, anaerobic digestion there. Um, they grow corn silage, not to feed the livestock, to be feedstock to add to their to add to the manure stream from the cattle. And a number of those farmers said that it was the most profitable segment of their diverse farms. And it's because um, in the EU, um, they usually had like a 10 year guaranteed rate on their electricity um, that made it lucrative and certain. And here in the US, um, as I understand it, that's why we tend to see um, it limited to much larger farms and uh, a lot of times still not profitable is that uh, they haven't always successfully had favorable rates from their utility and you're, if you're gonna hook up to the grid, you're pretty much limited to selling to that utility, I think. And, and a number of them more recently have uh, started making biogas instead of uh, running it through a generator and making electricity because then they can market that more easily to the highest bidder. But uh, 
it's a little bit related, I think, to uh, government encourage incentive, incentives or lack of what I would say. Thanks, Thank Matt. You. Matt, thank you for that. Yes, I, I don't understand the reasons, but based on a just recent email exchange with Becky Larson, um, she confirmed that the, the economics for farms had been bad, but are now better. And so um, at least the farms that have them are using them again. Um, there was a period, I think, when the natural gas prices were low or whatever, that it was very economically questionable for farms in Wisconsin. And that policy difference between Germany and the US is immense. I mean, I just looked up the numbers. I don't have them at the top of my head. But in Germany, I think about half of the, all of their livestock manure goes through a biodigester. And in Wisconsin, it's, it's a very, very small percentage. Um, and Wisconsin is one of the leaders in the US. I can share just a little bit too. From the utility side, um, distributed generation was always a challenge, the, not being able to control where the electricity is and going into the grid. I think that's changing quite a bit as well. I haven't been as involved with that as much, but you start to see the solar power coming in and different things like that, like Alliant has a huge solar investment now, and maybe those opportunities will change and the incentives that go with that could change that too. Um, that was always a concern. Utilities are required to um, make sure there's equal amounts of electricity and having different places of generation and not able to control that at least maybe 10 or 15 years ago was a major, major issue for them. So um, hopefully those things will start to be overcome too as we have more opportunities. I see there's some links in the chat too, so. Um, I think Gene has his hand up, so. Gene, go ahead. I'm waiting patiently, but that's okay. Um, mine is really specific to the Driftless region. Um, the 2011 uh, wiki, uh, this chapter on ag talked about the increase in rate of soil erosion from the intensity of rainfall events and the state average increasing it by 150%. And we all deal with averages all the time and know what they are, uh, but it's also important to know what the ranges are um, because of our topography. Do we know, I mean, how is that going to impact Southwest Wisconsin with our hills and the change from a dairy to a cropping based uh, system that I'm guessing we're likely going to be way over 150% if we continue on current trends. And is that data available? Will that be in the new 2021 uh, wiki update? Or is there a way to access what that might mean for us? Um, I, I don't have the direct stats on that. And I'm not sure if we've got it covered in the, um, the update of the report. Um, we'd have to do some looking to see who might who might be able to do do that work or who, who might have those numbers but i you're right i mean the the averages don't probably aren't going to work too well in that region and i guess my other concern too is from a climatological point that region happens to sit in a favored region for kind of extreme nocturnal thunderstorm events that fire up west of there and then march forward to the east due to the low level jet and other things that I don't want to go too much into the weeds on but you could see it on the map that Dan showed of the where the um, uh, 100 year uh, events had been taking place and what the numbers were. Mm -hmm. It's a horrible confluence of topography, <laughs> heavy rainfall and then land management <laughs> yeah. change all together. Yeah, it's the trifecta that you don't want to see happening. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. This is, I'm glad you brought this up. It's, I'm, I'm, I, we used to have a soil uh, working group a long time ago. And uh, I'm guessing that came from that group. And that's, we haven't had that group, that, that working group for a while. So it's something that we'll have to um, bring up in this next report. Yeah. And can I just take a second to say, and I'm sorry, this sounds like, uh, uh, um, as I'm listening to Chris, who's, by the way, the chair of agronomy, I, I'm, and I'm, I'm in atmospheric and oceanic sciences, and as, as he's talking about these things, I'm thinking to myself, man, he could be a, he could be a faculty member in AOS. In fact, are, are you affiliate with us? Because 
Yeah. I mean, your knowledge of all of this detailed stuff is is just. <laughs> I know nothing about agronomy, but he knows everything about what I do. So. <laughs> Sorry, anyway, it's a little digression there. Great. Well, I see people are dropping off and this has been great. And I see some great, great comments in the chat. I just really want to thank you again very much. Um, we will follow up. Um, I'm going to look for your slides, Dan, and uh, I have I have Chris's slides. So I'll just get Chris's formal permission to share those with my colleagues. Um, and uh, this has been a great launch to our series. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for Thank the work.